I'm delighted to be here. In 1967, the graduating diploma from McAllister College, my alma mater, read at the very bottom of it, in accepting this degree, you accept the responsibility to work to make the world more just. Now, McAllister was, for me, an example of an institution, indeed an organizational culture, which strove to live by the values it tried to shape in its students. In fact, that experience has reinforced my belief that we cannot expect in our students what we do not model in our organizational culture on the campus. In fact, one of the great articles in organizational psychology that has always influenced me has got a wonderful title, and it's called On the Folly of Expecting A and Rewarding B. <laughs> so I hope as <clears throat> my remarks uh, come forth this morning that we think about both the person and the environment side of the equation. What is the campus culture in our classrooms, in our out of classrooms, in our programs, in the total kind of milieu of what we're producing? Because we can't ask for our students to become globally, more globally minded and more skilled and more mature if we don't offer an environment which really reinforces that. McAllister was, for me, a daily laboratory, a daily laboratory, which provided the necessary challenges and supports for engagement with diversity, for consideration of issues of justice seeking, and for the issues of global learning. I remember my final exam just shortly before I was awarded that diploma. I was in a lecture hall all by myself with a manila envelope on the desk. I opened it and there were three questions. The first one was, what have you seen? The second one was, what have you heard? And the third one was, and what will you do now for hours? Okay. Well, what you're getting today is my response to that exam. <laughs> McAllister assumed that it had provided me with educational opportunities. But more importantly, it assumed that I had been present and engaged in those opportunities. In the context of the 60s at that time, as you recall, or the active civil rights movement in this country, the whole issue of the Vietnam War, uh, McAllister hosted the World Press Institute, and it was one of my first exposures to the fact that people from around the world didn't view issues in the United States the way I viewed issues in the United States. Uh, it was an active, wonderful, living laboratory, as I said, and when I graduated, like my peers, I graduated certain, certain, that we could repair the world. And that was so attuned to my own Jewish heritage and values of tikkun olam, of repairing the world, that I graduated knowing with great certainty that we could, my generation, create a new Eden, an Eden once again, of peace and justice. Now, half a century later, some thoughts I'd like to share with you on what happened to that sense of certainty. Four years now, I have been teaching classes on college student development, on intercultural communication, and on professional ethics. And <clears throat> in those classes, I often find myself using what is called an abstract moral dilemma. And I'd like to share it um, with you. It's a fable, and here's how the fable goes. All the members of the Mole family have worked very hard to gather food and make all the preparations necessary for their community of caves to be warm and safe for the long, cold winter ahead. One day, just as the moles are finishing their preparations, a group of porcupines comes by and informs them, we are cold, we are hungry, please help us. May we share your cave for the winter. The moles invite the porcupines to share their caves for the winter, 
only to find later that the sharp quills of the porcupines and the large appetites of the porcupines make them uncomfortable to be around. And the moles are worried about running out of food. The moles ask the porcupines to leave. We have tried this arrangement, the moles say, and it isn't working, so we need you to leave. The porcupines refuse to leave and declare, these caves suit us very well, and it is already winter, so we will not leave. The way it works in the classes is you have <clears throat> small groups read the dilemma out loud to each other and then discuss the following questions. How should the animals attempt to solve this problem? What are some of the solutions to the problem? What are the reasons and justifications for each of the solutions you are suggesting? And does this moral dilemma remind you of anything in the world around you. Pretty typical, high impact, small group discussion with a group of diverse people exercise. I've read the handouts too. <laughs> okay. I actually think it's AAC and use holy triptych, like the midi medieval altars. In the center are the essential learning outcomes. And then on the one side of the altar are high impact practices and on the other side are principles of excellence. Oh, we bow at the altar. <laughs> Nobody tell Carol. Okay. <laughs> Students don't have any problem solving the dilemma from the moles and the porcupines point of view. They come up with some pretty typical kinds of solutions. Uh, one of them is um, that uh, there should be a sign that says no porcupines are allowed, and that means they don't really have to deal with each other. Another one is, is that they should use the, um, the porcupine skills with the quills to build bigger caves so that they can share. Another one is, um, it came from a little six-year-old actually, we did these dilemmas initially with children. Um, my favorite one was that you should put marshmallows on the tip of the quills. Now, you'll see the logical infallacy here, so that they can eat the marshmallows, but then, of course, you would be left with the quills. But <laughs> it's pretty typical, and the students have a good time with it, and they come together, and of course, we're exploring what are different value perspectives, the community, individualism, property rights, all those kinds of things, in terms of solving a moral dilemma. And it's friendly and it's fun and they have a great time. And they explore the implications for moral development theory. But then when it comes to the question of what other things does this remind you of, the following issues almost always come, and I've kept a record of this literally in all these classes for over a decade now. The first is that this is about race. It's all about affirmative action. Right? and who gets invited to college, and who belongs, and who doesn't. Very interesting, the students of color feel like they're the porcupines, and got invited and then asked to leave. Right. <clears throat> the second thing that comes up is Title IX. It's about gender, and who's pushing who around. It's particularly true uh, around issues of athletics. A third thing that comes up always, long before the current crisis in Europe, is immigration. Uh, and who gets invited, and who does the work, and who should be here. And a fourth one that comes up has to do with threats to beliefs, particularly around lesbian, gay, <clears throat> bisexual, and transgender issues, and particularly around issues of religious expression. But here, the tone changes. They can no longer easily make the empathic leap into the porcupine and the mole who is abstract and apart and out there and not threatening. But when the issue comes home through their own interpretation, not mine, their own interpretation, they're generating these alternatives. 
Then the capacity for empathy, the capacity for taking the other's perspective becomes much less. The tone becomes much more harsh and the discussion becomes quite different in terms of how we need to cope and deal with that. Now my beloved colleague at Teachers College, Peter Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, Peter Coleman, who is the director of the Center for Conflict Resolution there, <clears throat> has been working for years and has written several books about, and I recommend them to you, what he calls intractable conflicts. Intractable conflicts. And intractable conflicts have the following characteristics. And they are characteristics that I recognize in the student conversation when the porcupines and the moles shifts to race and immigration and gender and deeply held values and beliefs. Okay. One of the characteristics of intractable conflict is that it's intense. You begin the conflicts already in a heightened sense of tenseness and awareness. Now, now I don't know about you, but that's not my most relaxed way to feel empathic. It's like when my partner tells me we have something to discuss. <laughs> She's extroverted, I'm introverted. She wants to sit down and discuss it. I want to go to the library and read about conflict resolution. <laughs> Intractable <clears throat> conflicts are also often seen as deadlocked, dead-ended, that there isn't an easy way out. It's why they're intractable. It's why they're dilemmas. Okay? Intractable conflicts are resistant to de-escalation or resolution. One becomes invested in the very intensity and righteousness of one side in the conflict. Intractable conflicts tend to persist over time. They have periods of greater and lesser intended, um, intensity, but they tend to persist over time. And here's the issue that is particularly critical. Even in the youngest generation, the conflict feels as if you had been there. Okay. History is a critical issue here. It is not the past. It is living in the people who are in the conflict. I can't stress how powerful that is. Okay. <clears throat> Intractable conflicts have at their core fundamental conflicts about human needs and human values. It is deeply intercultural at its base. Understanding cultures as having deep structures of belief systems, value systems, ways of relating in the world, ways of being in the world, ways of dis defining one's role and purpose in the world. And intractable conflicts almost always hinge on the very deep, deep embedded parts of our culture. They tend to pervade all aspects of people's lives and at their worst, the resolution of an intractable conflict is seen as the legitimate destruction of the other. Intractable conflicts tend to be resistant to common resolution techniques that we use on college campuses all the time, such as logic-based negotiation, empathy-based mediation, tact and diplomacy. That's what we do. Okay. Now any of us who have survived faculty meetings <laughs> know that negotiation, mediation, and diplomacy hide very deep things. As Bill Perry, the great developmental intellectual development theorist, once said, when intelligent people behave stupidly, we are in the presence of very powerful forces. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> in intercultural communication and intractable conflicts, 
we often need to focus on four, or excuse me, five critical things. The first is that <clears throat> these conflicts are seen as initially ir irreconcilable moral issues. It's not just that we are different, it's that we are righteously different, and the other is wrong. I grew up in a small rural area in Minnesota where the definition of diversity was that there were three Lutheran churches. <laughs> and the definition of truth was two of them were wrong. <laughs> you spent your life trying to figure out which two they were. <laughs> Intercultural communication and intractable conflicts feel like high stakes. They're very high stakes. They also <clears throat> are deeply related to relational power and authority, particularly around hierarchical authority and roles, and particularly around ownership of place and space, which includes, on the college campus, ownership of ideas and the rightness of certain kinds of ideas. And these conflicts are always deeply embedded in identity issues, okay? You don't have the conflict, the conflict has you, okay? in terms of the expression. And all of these are bowed by the weight of history. Just think about the issue of race in the United States as enormously and fractured and complex as that is, and how that plays out differently in other countries and other places of the world. It's a very critical kind of issue in many of my intercultural communication classes of helping deal with what is the history of race or ethnicity or class or caste in the different cultures and where is that similar but also where is that not analogous um, uh, as, we, as we tend to cross cultures. Well, in the face of this, and now I'm not just talking about stuff that lends itself to easy mediation. I'm talking about the intractable. And I'm talking about the history of intractable conflicts that our students bring with them, both locally and internationally, or even in the family. I just refer you to your last Thanksgiving dinner. Um, one of the questions is, can we prepare in the living laboratory that is each of our campus, can we prepare our students to cope with the intractable? Right? John Dewey once wrote that the central purpose of education is to create in our students and in ourselves, listen to the community of that, in our students and in ourselves, the capacities for associative living, the capacities for associative living. And we need to ask ourselves, what are those capacities? What are the capacities for living in a complex world that is not just full of diversity and difference, but is full of the intractable? And do our college campuses through our programs and our curriculum, our mentoring, our advising, our modeling, have a chance at producing those capacities. I like to think of this list of capacities that I'm going to share with you as braided, like a hollow bread uh, for sh Shabbos. You take the different strands of the bread and you weave them together, or strands of your hair and you weave them together. And you can pull each one of those strands out and examine it individually. That's going to produce the list. But we know that these capacities are braided. They're integrated. We ought not to be separating our students' intellectual development from their empathic development, from their personal emotional development, from their intercultural development and awareness. This is a braided whole. It takes the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker to produce this braided whole. But here are the list of capacities that <clears throat> people like Peter Coleman, myself, certainly John Dewey, many, many other people 
uh, that have worked in this area suggest are necessary uh, to be braided together in producing a student who is capable of dealing not just with conflict, but with intractable conflict. One is true cognitive complexity. More about that in a minute. I'm gonna pull that one strand out and put it under the micros microscope. The second one is emotional maturity. A third one is intercultural empathy. A fourth one is wide behavioral repertoire, skills and abilities that cross appropriate time, place, and role. Another one is a personal social identity maturity, an understanding of what many of us have called the multicultural self that we are multiple selves, multiple identities, our age, our gender, our sexual orientation, our religion, our history, um, all so many things about us, our race, our ethnicity, our traditions, our value systems are all woven together. And if most of us are honest with each other, that weave isn't always comfortable. There are parts of me that feel like they're at war with other parts of me. And some parts of me are more assailant at one point in time in my life than others. So how do we think about the mature social identity of an individual in dealing with the multiple aspects of who they are and where they present themselves? Another one, and this I think is a really critical issue for our students now, is a realistic assessment of the environments around them and of the people in those environments, a realistic assessment. William Sedlicek, a marvelous researcher at the University of Maryland, found that <clears throat> those students who had previously <clears throat> not been served in higher education, first generation students, students of color, often international students, <clears throat> those students who had the most realistic assessment of the environment and when it was helping them and when it was hindering them, when it gave them messages of mattering, when it gave them messages of marginality, those were the students who survived the environment most successfully. The students with unrealistic ability to assess that did not survive as well. Another capacity is the openness and adaptability, the seeking of the innovative, the seeking of the new, the seeking of what has not been thought or what has not been proposed. And the last one, certainly we could associate with Martin Buber's concept of I, thou, and that is a sense that one is a part of a larger we. <clears throat> that the work that we do is a part of the whole, and it's a part of the whole of the campus, it's a part of the whole of the class, it's a part of the whole of the community, it's a part of the whole of what we heard so eloquently described in our opening plenary um, last night. But I want to focus this morning on the issue of cognitive complexity, uh, remembering that it's braided with all those other things. Right? <clears throat> because cognitive complexity or intellectual development, the capacity of our students to make meaning in increasingly complex ways in an increasingly complex world, seems to me certainly one of the common things that we can understand. We do that in advising, we do that in our curriculum, we do that in our internships, we do that um, in our community, that we are wanting to produce students, wanting to produce students who have the capacity to think complexly in a movement from simplistic or either or thinking in its naive expression, the search for the right answer, in its pernicious expression, the knowing what the right answer is, in its naive expression, thinking the wrong, all the other answers than mine are just simply mistaken or wrong, but in its pernicious expression, thinking that all them are, the others are so wrong, they should be destroyed or eliminated because they are less than human and think differently than me. I think it's enormously important for us to think about the difference between naive, we was all there, and pernicious, 
Some folks still are. Okay. The movement from simplistic or either or thinking, often called dualistic thinking, to a more multiplistic and open thinking frequently takes <clears throat> the next phase of the recognition that differences exist. They just do. They're uncomfortable, they're confusing, sometimes they're even exciting, but they're there. <clears throat> but in that early recognition that differences exist, the classic stance is initially not to engage in them. Okay? If we go to the wonderful slides from last night, to see all those islands, but only really sail to one. But you know the other ones, or sort of out there somewhere. Okay. <clears throat> and my friends, Milton and Janet Bennett, <clears throat> were Peace Corps volunteers when, I, when I, we were the same generation. And they were on the island of Truk. I was thinking about them last night during the presentation. Um, and uh, Truk is uh, less than two miles long and less than a half a mile wide. And <clears throat> they were told that for the first six months that they were on the island, they should stay in their village. And again, practicing the language, getting to know the customs, all of that. And <clears throat> one day, Milton and Janet started to walk outside the village. And the elders of the village ran and said, where are you going? Where are you going? Where, where are you going? I said, oh, well, we're going to the village on the other end of the island. Less than two miles long, half a mile wide. And the elders said, be careful. The people are different out there. The people are different out there. That's the kind of movement into multiplicity. It exists, but they're different, and we don't really engage. That moves into another thing of acceptance and engagement, where difference is truly engaged, where one is beginning to puzzle through the great paradox that we can be similar and different from each other at the same time. And how is it that one can really hold a perspective that is different from mine? And you, you see both an excitement and a kind of a puzzlement. Really? You think that way? But the tone moves from how could you think that way to how could you think that way? It's a whole different sort of engagement and movement into the dialogue. And the last phase of the kind of intellectual development model that we are sort of Reader's Digest outlining for you here today is what we call commitment, a commitment to listening to understand. We wrote an article about listening to understand that is in uh, uh, liberal learning <coughs> um, of, so, of some years ago. And listening to understand has everything to do with how one appro approaches intractable conflict. Okay. The first is <clears throat> that students recognize <clears throat> and listen for, and listen for, listen to discern, discernment being an intellectual and an empathic capacity. Listen for the meaning-making stance of the other, the standpoint of the other, the positionality of the other, what we sometimes have called in our work at AACNU and elsewhere, the perspective taking of the other. How is it that the other makes meaning? Right? A genuine wondering for how that meaning is made and what are the sources culturally and valuably and experientially that produce the capacity to make meaning that way. And in that listening, the individual realizes that understanding the other more clearly results almost inevitably in understanding the self more clearly. And in that dialogue, greater possibilities, greater possibilities of understanding of self and of other and of each other are made possible. Listening to understand also 
as the student coming to deeply know that our positionality, our standpoint, our meeting-making stance produces affect. We don't just have a perspective on something. We have a valuing experience of something. Right? And those can't really be separated. That's yeah. why we have conflict. That's why we have conflict. Not just a debate. No. <clears throat> Listening to understand, and people who are really committed to that, work very hard to stay in contact, to stay in communion with the other, especially when the other either confuses them or makes them afraid. I have learned in my home life that at the time that I want to get my library card, I need to stay at the kitchen table. Okay? And it is the very strength of the urge to get the library card that tells me how important it is to stay at the kitchen table. All right. People who are committed to listening to understand are also committed to searching for the appropriate response in the face of the reality that we will frequently get it wrong the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth time. Okay? But that we are trying to find a way to communicate. As Adrian Rich has written, we are trying for a common language, for words that connect the dream of a common language. <clears throat> Commitment to listening to understand is deeply, deeply embedded in the realization that understanding does not require agreement. This is a critical issue on our campuses. It certainly was when any of us were on a campus, but it is deeply, deeply imperative now. With the fear of so many students of encountering material that they fear will be too challenging for them or too upsetting for them. <clears throat> With the, the, the canard that we are <clears throat> trying to over-liberalize uh, our students and that the curriculum is propaganda, we, we've all read these headlines. But the great fear on the part of the student is that if I am exposed to the other, I will be contaminated. The greater fear is, if I understand the other, I might change my mind. And then who am I? And then who am I? One of the great fears, right, is being cast out of Eden. It was the knowledge of good and evil, not good and evil, it was the knowledge of good and evil that got them cast out. <clears throat> listening, and the commitment to listening to understand also involves <clears throat> an internal motivation to constantly seek to expand the complexity of one's own understanding and to always retain, always retain the responsibility of making ethical judgments. Because I understand something, not only does it imply that I agree with it, but it doesn't keep me from making judgments about whether I think, in fact, in a world seeking justice and fairness, something is a good or a bad practice. Intellectual development is not a cheap relativistic thing. Right? It is a contextual relativistic thing. It is contextual to what? It is always a deeply ethical kind of stance that one is ethically bound to understand the new, the other, the different, but one is also ethically bound to lead one's life in a way that is consistent and coherent and that one can deeply value. It involves us then in living with enormous contradictions, 
enormous contradictions at the same time. Can I deeply believe in individual rights and your rights for something, but also within my own stance of faith or belief or, or any other kind of system, think that it is not what I would do? How does one deal with this inherent contradiction right, of understanding but not agreement and having an ethical stance in the world? I deeply believe as McAllister shaped me to believe 50 years ago, that our campuses are the new American common or the new global common. When I was a little girl, <clears throat> my father had been killed in the Korean War, and so I was sent to live with my grandparents outside Boston. And my grandmother, uh, both my grandparents were immigrants, my grandfather from Nova Scotia and my grandmother from Great Britain. When my grandmother died in her 80s, she still had a queen, uh, she, even though she'd been living in the colonies for some 60 years at that point. But if I was very, very good, <clears throat> and those of you that know me will not be able to imagine what I'm about to describe, but if I was <clears throat> very, very good, my grandmother would dress me up in my pinafore and apron, black patent leather shoes, white gloves, and take me into the Boston Common. Uh, every time I go to Boston, I still have to go see Make Way for Ducklings and, and the Shaw Memorial, and all the extraordinary things that it is. But she would explain to me in her wonderful accent what a common was and how the colonies had learned about a common from Great Britain, and that they were gathering places <clears throat> for people who were different. They were places of commerce, places of conversation, places of community, places of safety. We know that the common was not perfect. Many people were excluded from the common, let us be clear. But it had a magic kind of notion for me that it was a place where we could all gather where great differences could come in some peaceful way in engagement. And I think the American campus is the new American common. And indeed, I think of it as the global common. Our campuses are the most diverse places in our society. They are where we gather. <clears throat> with not only all our differences, but they are where we gather in the face of our intractable conflicts, which are also gathered with us. They are a space, I believe, not to where all conflict will be resolved. In fact, I don't think it ever will be. But they are a space anchored in a committed resolution to continue engagement, a committed resolution to continue engagement in the face of intractable conflicts. Because only in that engagement can we think about repairing the world. We live in the in-between souls in a kind of global diaspora still seeking to repair the world, still seeking what Judy Chicago sought in her merger poem. <clears throat> and then all that has divided us will merge, and then compassion will be wedded to power, and then softness will come to a world that is harsh and unkind. Then both men and women will be gentle, and both women and men will be strong. And then no person will be subject to another's will. And then all will be varied, rich, and free. And then the greed of some will give way to the needs of many. And then all will share equally in the world's abundance and all will care for the sick and the weak and the old, and all will nourish the young, and all will cherish life's creatures and the earth, 
and all will live in harmony with each other and the earth. And then everywhere will be Eden once again. Thank you. We do have time for just a few questions. If you want to continue the dialogue and engagement, there are microphones here if anyone would like to step up. Hi, Lee. Hi. I want to say how much I enjoyed that. Um, I'm a big admirer of yours. Um, to you. <laughs> Question. It's, a, it's very lovely. And of course, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a factual question or an opinion question. The, the four stages that you mentioned, right. um, I teach an undergraduate course. I teach a, a, a freshman first year seminar. And I'm really tempted to tell the students these stages. Um, I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not. How do you, how do you work with your students around those stages? Um, <clears throat> what, a, what, a lovely, what a lovely question. Um, the, you know, the, those, those stages are sort of a Reader's Digest. McAllister's funded by Reader's Digest, by the way. That's, <laughs> You can always tell a McAllister graduate student we write short pa papers with a little joke on the last page. Or um, <laughs> uh, a Reader's Digest version of you know work like William Perry, my own work in intellectual development, right. Kitchener and King's work in reflective judgment, the fabulous work in women's ways of knowing, and a basic sort of classic intellectual development um, phases. And what we found in our research over the years um, is that... Um, Students tend to be able to to move into the reasoning of a, of a phase just above them, but but and that's challenging but supportive because the leap isn't too great. But phases too far above them, you know, you're taking off at LaGuardia and I'm landing at Newark or something. Right. Um, I think the the critical issue for me is if we think we hear. Um, elements of the, that kind of meaning making or thinking, how do we encourage um, the, the engagement with the next? Um, I remember when I announced to one of my professors that I knew what great poetry was at McAllister and that great poetry was written by great poets and that great, <laughs> great poets wrote poems were so smart that they wrote poems that rhymed in every language. Just, uh, he likened us how he had not heard that theory before. <laughs> but, but, but in serious answer to your question, I, I, will, I will never forget three things uh, about that encounter. Tur turns out 25 years later, he hadn't forgotten that encounter either. Um, one of them was he was there. He was in his office when I arrived to announce my theory. <laughs> Secondly, he never robbed me of my victory. He never robbed me of my victory. And thirdly, he, he reached behind him and he, and he pulled two books off the shelf and he said, and this is the developmental issue, some people, some people think these are great poets. Would you like to take them back to the dorm and then come back next week and we'll talk about it? One of them was by E. e. Cummings, mm -hmm. right? I and mean, the words were all over the page. <laughs> and the other one was by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and you wouldn't, you shouldn't even rhyme some of those words. <laughs> and, and, I, and I met with him every week until I graduated. And that happened in the spring of my freshman year. Wow. 
So the issue for me of the phases is if we, if we think we hear them, then how do we help the student open to the next? Not, not go faster than they can go, um, but, but not stay at a plateau where they're, where they're, where they're not opening. Um, that's the, the, for me, I was joking about the triptych before, but for me, those principles of excellence, that's what those principles are all about. How do you hear where the student is and help in, a, in an accompaniment way? Paul, Paul Farmer's great phrase, accompaniment. I will accompany you on this journey, right? He, 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 he was there, he never robbed me of my victory, but he accompanied me. Um, uh, on that, on that, uh, on that journey, and and that's what those phases are for me. I do believe, however, that we should take an understanding of those phases in general into account when we are designing courses across the curriculum and programs for different levels of different students. Not because we can peg students in those phases exactly, but because it gives us a scaffolding that is um, potentially more deliberate, more purposeful uh, than uh, just a kind of a menu offering. Now, thank you for that question. But you do not tell them that as a roadmap. That's what I was wondering. No. Okay. No, because um, it's their road. Okay. You know, yeah. if, he had, if he had said to me, um, no one in the entire history of the English language would take that theory seriously. <laughs> you might not be stuck with me today. Yeah. Right? Okay. Maybe he should have actually done that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so my question, um, and I'm here from Minnesota. My question Don't is... Don't you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. You betcha. So my question is how to support the student who perhaps comes from a group f who was excluded from the commons, right? And who is new in the, dis the, dis the discussion and when the discussion gets hard or ugly says, I'm done, I'm out of here. Well, and then we'll just do the Middle East um, after break. Uh, um, this is this is where this is uh, the three levels. One of them is the student should always be accompanied, right? Um, but this is where uh, the work moves from the individual level, which is an enormously important level of our work, to um, the structural level. Uh, if, 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 if a student who has previously been excluded is encountering structures that are still exclusionary, however subtle, uh, or we may think they're subtle, but they feel like a hammer uh, to the student, uh, then our, our work, it may be to accompany the student for sure, but it is to change the environment, absolutely. It is to change the environment. Uh, a number of years ago, when I had the great privilege for over 20 years actually to teach in the International Summer Institute for Intercultural Communication, um, I, I had broken my leg and I was in a wheelchair uh, during the summer sessions. Uh, we, we would take over campus for about a month. And um, uh, uh, there were absolutely no ramps or facilities or anything like that. And I, um, I knew the president, actually, uh, a very dear person. And at the end of the sum, the three weeks, I had taken notes and I went to meet with her. And I said, um, this is what I experienced over the three weeks. And she looked at me and quite innocently said, well, we don't have any physically handicapped students on the campus. Yeah, you want, to, want some hints about why that could be? <laughs> um, and so that, that's really where we've got to deal uh, at, a, at a very serious systems level, uh, that, that we, we are about change um, at, the, at the individual, at the group, but, 
but significantly at the organization and the, and the systems level. And we all know that. That's true in our scholarship, what's included, what's at, who, whose voices get on the learning wheel, right? Whose perspectives get. Um, Karen McTie Musil is here and she directed, and I was a part of, uh, the Core Commitments Project uh, at AACNU a number of years ago. And one of the dimensions we looked at was um, students taking seriously the perspective of others, especially those with whom they disagree. Taking seriously the perspective of others, especially with those with whom they disagree. And we asked a real and ideal question. Should this be part of your campus experience? Is it? And there was a gap between the real and ideal. There should be a gap between heaven and hell. Um, but the gap grew statistically significantly from the first to the second, the second to the third, and the third to the fourth year, right? So the very students that were all endorsing this should be a part of what we're doing kept saying, but it's less and less what we're doing, taking seriously the perspective of others, especially with those with whom we disagree. Well, that's not the student's problem. That's the campus's problem. Well, it's both a problem, right? So I, I think really, we have got to be in the business of systems change, not just our classroom, not just our office, but the system. And in order to do that, we have to listen to the people that are telling us messages about the system. Because if we listen to the people that are comfortable in the system, we won't ever see the flaws in the system. <laughs>